Hi, my name is Mike Gabin and it's time for some more KSP Math. The Oberth Effect, named after Hermann Oberth, it is the effect that, if you are burning prograde or retrograde, the most efficient place to perform the burn is as close to the parent body as possible. Many KSP players know of the Oberth Effect and use it well, but what I want to examine is why it works at all. Why does it only work in the prograde retrograde direction? In the normal or radial direction, the opposite is true, which is something I'll leave for the next video. Today, it's the Oberth effect, so let's do the math. I think of orbital mechanics in terms of energy. I first talked about this when developing the vis viva equations, namely that the mechanical energy of an object in orbit is just a function of two things, its altitude and its speed. In addition, the mechanical energy of a stable orbit is a constant. That's why when you gain altitude, you lose speed and vice versa. If you want to change the altitude of the orbit, then you have to add or remove energy. And the only way you have of doing that is by changing your current speed. That is why delta V is such an important idea in orbital mechanics. Before looking more closely at energy associated with speed, called kinetic energy, let's consider what a physicist means when she says energy in the first place. Energy has a remarkably simple definition. It's the ability to do work. For example, if you apply a force to an object causing it to move a distance, then you just did work. More specifically, if you apply a force of one newton, moving an object one meter, you just did exactly one joule of work. Actually, this is exactly the definition of what a joule is. So if we want to know how much kinetic energy an object has, we need to calculate the amount of work it took to get that object to its current state. Consider an object of mass m that we're going to bring from rest to a speed v in an ideal environment where there is no friction or air resistance on the object. Hmm, sounds like space to me. We'll accomplish this by applying a constant force F to the object. We'll let D represent the distance that the object traveled while getting to its final speed. The amount of kinetic energy given to the object is equal to the force applied times the distance traveled. By Newton's second law, the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the object. Also, the distance traveled by an object undergoing a constant acceleration is equal to one-half times the acceleration multiplied by the time interval squared. Substituting in, we get this. But I don't want acceleration, I want speed, and I sure as heck don't want that time interval in there. Fortunately, it's easy to get rid of, as acceleration is simply the change in velocity divided by the time interval. And since we started our object from rest, it's just the final velocity divided by time. Substituting in, we can see that the delta t's just divide away, leaving us our kinetic energy formula. Before we continue, I want to do one more thing with this formula. I'm going to divide the mass over to the left and replace the ek with epsilon k. This is now an energy density formula measured in joules per kilogram. It will simplify our upcoming work. I did the same thing back in the vis viva equation video. The key to the Oberth effect is the square on the speed. This is a graph of the kinetic energy density in kilojoules per kilogram as a function of speed in meters per second. As you can see, it isn't linear. The curve just keeps getting steeper as we move from left to right. Let's examine it more closely by looking at some specific examples. An object at rest needs to get up to a speed of 1,414 meters per second in order to get a, to a kinetic energy density of 1,000 kilojoules per kilogram. But look what happens when we look at the speed increase required for the next 1,000. We get this by only adding 586 meters per second. And the cost of the additional energy will only keep going down as our speed increases. And remember, changing your orbit's altitude is all about changing your kinetic energy. What the graph shows is that the faster you are going, the less delta V you have to spend in order to add or subtract energy from your orbit. In a nutshell, that's the Oberth effect. As mentioned, next time we'll look at why the effect is the opposite for normal and radial burns, but I want to end this video with a challenge question for you. It's clear that the Oberth effect is very useful, but should you make use of it whenever possible? 
Let's make this more specific. Let's say I have a probe in an 80 kilometer circular equatorial orbit about Kerbin that I would like to put in a 1000 kilometer circular equatorial orbit about the moon. How should I perform the insertion? Should I take advantage of the Oberth effect by making my approach to the moon as close as possible, say 10 kilometers? Get the capture there, bringing my apoapsis down to 1000 kilometers and then circularize at apoapsis, or should I make my closest approach to the desired altitude of the orbit, 1,000 kilometers, then simply capture and circularize in a single burn at my closest approach? Which way is the most efficient? Some follow-up questions. Would the answer be different if my target orbit were a different altitude, or around a different body in the solar system? The series has presented you with all the tools you need. Specifically, you'll need the VIS-VV equations from episode 2, and how to calculate capture costs that was explained in episode 6. I look forward to seeing your answers in the comments and as always thank you for watching and I hope to see you again next time.